Okay, this is the one that I think is the coolest, so if you haven't seen me nerd out yet, here we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> Marchantia polymorpha, this is a really common liverwort. Again, it's one of those species that if you look at an old fire pit, it grows on the kind of that charcoal. Um, it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, but look at these structures. So these are the female structures um, that grow. So we know now that mosses need the sperm to get to the, the eggs, but how do they swim? And there's, what's the, they're up on stalks, and there's males. There's not any males in this picture, but they're more of a flat-shaped umbrella. So we have sperm swimming down and then trying to swim up, and they need all this water, and what's going on? How do they do that? Well, these things are so beautifully designed. So here's a male. That's what their structure looks like. Here's the female. Well, that's what their structure looks like. And there it is with a water droplet just hanging there. Well, cool. So the sperm can get there and they can hang out for a while and reach their spot and it can fertilize and create spores because that water droplet's just hanging there. Hmm, how is it hanging there? So they took one of these off and stuck a needle in it and put it in a, a container of water. And yeah, the surface tension of the water just keeps it hanging right inside that structure. Um, so it's perfectly designed for what it needs to do. And now we can use that structure and make a plastic or some type of polymer pipette to transfer water droplets. Now most pipettes that you think use some type of suction to draw water up and then dispense the water. This doesn't need any sort of suction, so it's a little more delicate in the way that you can use it without causing that disturbance with that force that you need to suck up or suck down. So they've created these pipettes. Now they've created them really small, but up to a centimeter across will hold a water droplet. And then once, um, once it's in there, if you keep it straight up and down, the surface tension will keep that water droplet, and then you just tilt it a little bit, and that water droplet will fall right out. So. So is it made or they create something? They made them out of plastic, based on the design, based on the structure. So the paper has all these like designs, and you know, theta equals pi of this, and what this cone, or this, dome shape is that it needs to hold the water. But these down here, these are made out of some type of plastic or a polymer. <coughs> yeah, that's their thought that they'll use them in, in some type of lab. This is breaking news. This was like November 2018. So you heard it here first. <laughs> the Tenesca Cultural Center. <laughs> so I think that's totally cool. So now <laughs> we're going to switch gears and talk about conservation. So what do we know about mosses? Um, how do we conserve them? If they're such an important part of our ecosystem, then they need a little bit of protection. So this is just general information about what we know about in the state of Washington. So Judy Harpel is kind of the leading bryologist in Washington. Um, she used to work for the Forest Service, and then they eliminated that Bryology position, and she um, she went to consulting, um, and she's creating a checklist for mosses. And right now, she has 750 different species of mosses in the state of Washington. Um, so she's been working on that for years, and right now it's still not published. So we don't have any sort of real reference list to go to of what we have here in the state. For liverworts, the news is even. <coughs> Worse, there is no, it says I'm working on a checklist. <laughs> I was, and then I didn't, and now I have to start over. So we'll see about that. Um, so this CPNWH, what does that stand for? Consortium Pacific Northwest Herbaria. So this is a, a, at the University of Washington at their um, herbarium. They created a database where they <laughs> collected all sorts of specimens, vascular plants and lichens and bryophytes. Um, and they're all in one database. So this includes schools in Oregon, UBC, all the schools in Washington have their data in this. So it's this like huge database of Northwest herbaria. 
And so this is the best we have. And it's only as good as the things that have been put into herbaria, right? There's lots of species we know about that we never collected and sent to an herbarium. But, um, so this is the best information we have. And when I queried it and kind of sorted through the different nomenclatures and different, we have about 230 species of liverworts in the state of Washington. Hornwort species, there are about five, and that's also from a um, herbarium query. <coughs> As far as what's rare, um, this is also lacking information. So Judy Harpel, when she was the bryolo bryologist for the Forest Service, really helped the state of Washington put together a rare species list. This was in 1996, and there have been no updates since then. So it's a little dated. There are things that should probably come off the list, and many, many species that should be added onto that list. Um, there are no lists of rare liverworts or cornworts for the state of Washington. So it's really cool. You find something, you key it, you look at it, and you're like, wow, this is really neat. I don't think I've seen this before. And then you go to look, and there's no list to see if it's new to the state or how, how um, frequent it has occurred. So this is definitely a, a lacking part of information that we have in the state is um, what could be considered rare. So I was able to, um, for the last couple of years working for the Forest Service, uh, did a, a wetland study. Um, it was over two summers, and we had, I had 19 sites on five different ranger districts, all the way from Natchez, Cleon, and Yanchlan to Nascot. So that's most of the ranger districts on the Okanagan and Wenatchee Forest. Um, from that, and these are mostly, we're trying to target fen, fen-like habitats where there's just, the ground is squishy and you're just in mosses all day long. Um, so that's what we were looking for. Not all 19 sites were like that. Um, but in these sites, we found 47 rare bryophytes. So rare was either things that were on Judy's list from 1996, or that had like fewer than 20, usually fewer than 10 sightings known in the state of Washington based on the consortium. So of those 47, 21 of them were the things on the list, but those were seven different species. So when you found, when you found them, you know, they were in multiple sites. But these non-listed species, these things that we didn't really know about very much, 26 sightings of 26 different species. So you kick and you get these little, the micro of the micro habitats within a rare habitat, and you get these cool species that just aren't known very much. And um, so I think it was a very successful um, study that I got to do. I'm very happy that I got to do it. Um, do we think this is an increase or a decrease? Sorry? Do we think this is an increase in moss species? Um, I just think it's uh, the things that we haven't known about because we haven't been there and done the studying. Um, yeah, I don't think the moss community has changed all that much over the years. It's just our ability to get out there and to study them. There aren't very many people that do this. <laughs> so. Um, they just haven't been located. I'll just point out, this is Taylorea lingulata. Um, this is one of those dung mosses that we talked about. We don't have any of the really cool umbrella pink shaped ones, but we have these and they have specialized capsules and sticky spores. And this was, um, not my picture, it's not from around here, but I did find this up um, in one of the wetlands between Long Swamp and Tiffany up there on the crest. So when I did my master's degree, I did it, um, I was able to do it around here. So I did all of my field work in the Okanagan Highlands area. This was the, one, the, <laughs> the paper that I published was called Patterns of Rarity and Mosses of the Okanagan Highlands of Washington State, an Emerging Course Filter Approach to Moss Conservation. It's a lot of words. Um, what were we interested in? 
is what correlates to rarity? Can we protect rare species without knowing what each species is and the exact um, locations where it's at? And so we, we, I went to lots of sites, over 100, maybe 141 sites, and collected mosses within a mesohabitat of a forest type. And um, so I got like 267 species of mosses and liverworts just in the Okanagan Highlands area. And then we took those and, and ran them against moisture and weather and um, elevation and all these different things. And what did we find? But that if you are in a unique habitat, you're going to get unique species. That was the overriding thing. 